The Princess Diaries is, um, is the only film that my 18-year-old daughter has seen that I have been in. She, but last year I took her to a fan convention in Brazil and I introduced her to Chris Pine. At the end I said, look, first time you've been abroad uh, to Latin America. Um, what, are your, what are your memories? And she said, well, first of all, Daddy, I was surprised how many people like you. <laughs> Thanks, kid. <laughs> uh, and I said, anything else? And she said, yes. How tall Chris Pine is. <laughs> how handsome Chris Pine is. Please welcome John Reese Davies! <laughs> Have a seat, relax. Thank you, sir. That right there's good. How wonderful it is to see all you homeless people coming in out of the rain. <laughs> uh, I, I only wish we had a big television here and, and more heaters and then we could all huddle together and uh, bemoan the fate of living in a climate like Pittsburgh or England or some other part of hell. Um, oh, did I... <laughs> Sorry about that, yes. <laughs> Do sit down. Make yourselves at home. Yes. Uh, and, and if you sit down, then the people behind you can see you, see. There you there go. You. Excellent. Well, there you are. Splendid, splendid. Now, what are we going to talk about? What do you want to talk about? I have a question right off the bat. It's probably a question you don't get a lot of, but I'd like to ask you about your role as Macro in I, Claudius from the BBC. He's very erudite and classically educated. And I gotta, I gotta ask, how did that come about and what was the atmosphere like on that set with such great, great, uh, with such a stellar cast? How many people have seen I, him and I, Claudius? Macro? All, all two of you, one, oh, three. Very good. Well, I, Claudius, we did, I think, in 19, what, 73? 76. 76, good Lord. Dear God, that long ago. <laughs> well, of course, we, <laughs> we were all quite young and quite good, but you know, some, of us, some of them went on and became remarkably great. Um, you know, uh, but it was extraordinary, yes. Uh, Robert Graves, by the way, was such an interesting person. He'd started off he joined the, uh, the army in 1914. In August 1914, uh, war was declared with Germany. And he had two weeks training and then he was, a, he was a lieutenant in two weeks of training. And he was, um, he was assigned to rounding up aliens and, and interning them all. And I think one of the people he interned or helped to turn up was a man called Joseph Pilates. Any of you ever studied Pilates, the, the movement yeah. thing? Yeah. No, I, I thought you looked so decrepit, really. Oh, <laughs> did I say that out loud? Um, but anyway, uh, yes, and he went on. He had a pretty horrendous war. And as he said, you know, everyone who was involved in that war was deeply affected. Sassoon went mad. Uh, the great poet Owen, uh, really, who died just before, was absolutely, I think, on the verge of complete nervous collapse. Um, and he decided that uh, he was going to be, he was going to be, a, wanted to be a writer. And he went off, and he, he, he had a most amazing career, but one of the things that he did write were these two wonderful books called I, Claudius, and Claudius the God, um, set in Roman times, and they're an imagined biography of the Emperor Claudius. Uh, and we did this wonderful series, which is still good. It really is worth seeing. I, I don't know how I got the job, because I've never quite worked out how the hell I ever passed any uh, audition at all, really, but, um, but somehow it happened, and um, uh, yes, 
I played Macro, the commander of the guard. In fact, I think it was the first time um, that I killed uh, Captain Kirk. Um, <laughs> I, I think the second time we, it was the Russian Revolution, and I think I killed him then. I know I've killed him a couple of times, really. <laughs> but Patrick looks pretty darned good, uh, you know, for a man that I personally have killed a couple of times. Um, and I must admit, my killer instinct is still there. Um, any, anyone who brings an ax into a room and gives it to me, you know, knows that their life is at risk. Um, oh, sorry, yes. I've avoided the question, haven't I? No, no, absolutely not. Oh, damn it. Um, <laughs> that that no. was my intention always, to avoid the question. Do you have another good question? Yes, I have one. We're going to switch gears and I'll talk to you about SpongeBob SquarePants. Ah, now we are talking about the classics. <laughs> my man Ray, I like to think, is definitive. You know, for a shifty spiv of a half man, half Ray, I think it is, well, clearly definitive, isn't it? I mean, there's no other word for it, yes. That splendid scene where they try to civilize me and, and, and get me to talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, have good manners, you know, I mean, this is, this is your wallet, is this, a, yes, it's a, it's a classic. Unfortunately, I've never actually seen it, but, um, <laughs> but, but I'm told it's a classic. It's a classic, it is a classic. Were you able to improvise much of your dialogue or was it all written? Well, the, <laughs> the, the truth is that the, the guys who write these things just love watching the actors play. And, and sometimes you do something, you, you go in and you do what they want, and then you start playing with it, and if you hear them giggling, then you know there's probably going to be a rewrite coming up shortly. <laughs> um, and, the, and that's the way it worked with Peter Jackson as well. We'd go in, uh, you know, I would do my stuff. I, d I tended to do my stuff at the end of the day because uh, the eyeline problem was, you know, since I'm meant to be down about this size and I couldn't actually spend the entire day like that giving them those wonderful eyelines. So we would put, put a, 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 a one of the smaller people in there yeah. and they would, you know, use him as an eyeline. And then at the end of the day, I would come in and... Uh, I would do my thing, and, and whenever, after we got what we had to do, then Peter would say, all right, I'm cutting you loose now, just vamp a little bit. And if I, if I heard him giggle, I would know that it would be in the first cut at least, you know. But some, some of the things did, did, did stick around, rather good. Did, it ha did you have any concerns getting involved with such an iconic story of Lord of the Rings? Did you have any concern that it would turn out as grand Lord as... Lord of the Rings, that interminably thick old book that only some people liked. My number one son, he came home at half term from school, locked himself in his bedroom and only came down for food while he worked his way through Lord of the Rings. Number two son and I... Uh, I would try to read it to him, and we would both fall asleep. Um, and, and, and finally, when I got cast in it, and I thought, oh, God, i got to read this damn thing. And I, I fell asleep two or three times in the reading of it. But finally, I did get to understand how it's made and, and the magic of it. It is an extraordinary work of literature. And... and it creates a, an entire genre uh, in literature as well. Uh, it is a remarkable book. And Tolkien, again, World War I. You know, Tolkien loses most of the... Uh, he, he loses all his close school friends. Um, he goes through the war and he does not break. And the reason I think he doesn't break is that, A, he's a Catholic and has a very strong religious faith, but secondly, he knows why he's fighting. He's fighting because German militarism is out to conquer and dominate the world. And if it 
if it doesn't, if it isn't stopped by his generation, then, uh, then a civilization will be lost. Uh, and he, uh, it, it is that knowledge. I mean, you don't, you don't stand in the first battle of the song, you know, where on the first day of the first battle, uh, the British army lost 20,000 dead and I think another 60 to 80,000 injured. The first day of the first battle, German army suffered the same sort of losses as well. You don't stand there, you know, watching the men on either side of you fall without asking yourself, why the hell am I here? Uh, and he knew. And he's one of those lucky guys who gets everything right. He comes back from the war, he is damaged, but not irreparably so. He marries his childhood sweetheart. You know, he's a successful family man. His sons love him and adore him. His students love and adore him. His colleagues even, love, and in academia, you know, it, particularly in Oxford or Cambridge like that, at places like that, you know, competition is very fierce. Uh, you know, you don't really love your colleagues, you know, you criticize them. I, I went looking for a, an agricultural tool and bought it in a, in a place in Oxfordshire, at a place called Mirkwood. And uh, I went and um, I, I, I said to the guy who, who, was, who had this thing, I said, is this a Tolkien reference? And he said, oh yes. Tolkien used to come here and write. Uh, he was staying with this professor, a colleague of his, and, uh, and in between, they actually made two towers. And there, there, are, there are two towers in this thing that they basically made pizza with, you know. Uh, they, they, but they made them by themselves. And, um, and, but the very fact that, you know, you can spend holiday time, you know, uh, uh, working on your book with a colleague indicates some measure of his real ability as a, a social man. He gets everything right. He's a good friend, he's a good father, he's a great teacher. Uh, and of course, you know, he creates a new genre in literature. It's pretty, oh, and of course he is also internationally famous, you know, as a, a scholar of Nordic and half a dozen other languages. Just a, just one of those giants, really. A bit like Graves, actually. So another question about Lord of the Rings. You got to voice Treebeard. How did that happen? Oh, Peter Jackson came up to me and he said, would you like to do the voice of Treebeard? And I thought, oh, good, more money. Yes, I love that. <laughs> Uh, and, and so I read it and I thought, ah, how would a tree, he's not a tree, he's a walking, talking ent. I mean, what sort of voice would a centuries old ent make? He has no lungs. How can I create the essence of this? Added to which, he's very slow. Now, there's an extraordinary thing that happens when you write something, we can read that, and our mind senses the slowness of it. But you can't do that in film. You can't go, you know, mm. no, not so hasty. We've lost the audience. How the heck do you convey that slowness of this ancient creature? 
How do you create a voice for it when it hasn't got any lungs? I mean, I tried sort of putting the, the sort of sucking sound of, 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 of roots coming out of the ground as he moved and things like that. We tried reducing, we tried reducing it down to whale noise, you know, recording it very fast and then, uh, uh, and then, um, I tried every darn thing. And in the end, all you could do is, you know, every, everything sounded wrong. It's the, it, it's, it's not the only part I've failed in, but I'm sure. But it's the only part that still wakes me up at night in a sweat. And I think, I don't know how to play this. In the end, all you had to do was actually just simply say, well, you know, I, it's lovely standing in the woods, woods and, and the little birds come and sit on my branches and, 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 and the mice run over my toes and tickles sometimes. But you, you've got that, but you've also got the elemental. Yeah, the ants are going to war. It's... Yes. Uh, I, you, you probably have heard that story that um, I, I went on a, 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 a TV, a, a radio show in New York, and the... The, 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 the producer there, the, 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 the interviewer there, he, he had some friends of his um, who were real Tolkien scholars. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll ask them on how you should play it. And uh, quite famously, one of them answered back and he said, well, there is only one actor in the world that can do this. At which point I did preen a little bit. <laughs> James Earl Jones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I told James that and he agreed. <laughs> Wonderful. No, it's, it's, um, it, it's still, I don't know how to do it. I just don't know how to do it. So anyone's got any notes, uh, it's too late now, but it might stop my nightmares, I suppose. Let's get some questions from the audience. Is that why, good? Why not? Why not? We'll get some questions from the audience. Please raise your hand and... Young man, yes. Well, well he's got to come around with a microphone. We'll, we'll get him. We'll get him next. Oh, over there. Back there. We'll get you. No worries. All right. Speak up nice and loud and turn the microphone on. That helps. We good or did the battery die? You need a new one? Testing. There, there you go. Go, buddy. Um, when you were making Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, did you know that it was going to be a big hit? I, I had just done Shogun, and, and thank you, uh, and I got an Emmy nomination for it. And because Shogun was so popular, um, Blake Edwards had asked me to do Victor Victoria. Well, partly because because Shogun was, in pop, was popular, but partly because they liked to come to England, you, they could find cheap actors there, and uh, they still do, actually. But um, anyway, um, and then Spielberg called up um, Blake and said, what's he like? And Blake came to me and he said, so I, I said, you're the sort of guy, you know, who um, beats small boys and kicks, kicks puppies. Uh, and I said, oh, thank you for that. Yes. Uh, and I got this script and it said, you know, uh, Salah is a five foot two skinny little Egyptian. Uh, and so I went along and saw Mrs. Spielberg and I said, oh, what are you proposing? Surgery and major dieting? Uh, and he said, no, 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 just play a, a combination of Falstaff and that and and um, and Rodriguez in Shogun and um, he said you know uh, we'll put a folly a funny accent in there and it'll be all right and I said oh okay very much I, I went away and read the script and uh, as I said and 
my agent called me up and he said, um, well, what's it like? And I said, I've never read a script like this before. It's pages and pages of description of action. There's very little dialogue in it. Um, uh, and and uh, he said, well, you don't have to do it. And I said, no, no, I mean, I know Stephen's, you, you know, work, he's done some good work, but he'd just come from 1941. Oh. And 1941, we now recognize as really a wonderful thing. But all the experts, all, all, all the critics said, well, of course, the boy genius has really found the wall now. You know, now we see how bad he can really be. Um, so it was a bit of a risk for him. Um, but I said, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. It'll either be the biggest disaster of all time, or it might just set a new fashion in filmmaking. Uh, so I turn up day one to do the last scene I've got in it, which said, Indian Marion say a sorrowful goodbye to Salah. Uh, so Stephen was sitting cross-legged on this quayside in La Rochelle, the old submarine base in La Rochelle. Uh, and he said, um, I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm writing your scene. He wouldn't say that. He'd be more inclined to say da 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 So he looked up at me and he said, all right, da 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 Oh, by the way, your character, um, when he's high or happy, bursts into Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, <laughs> incorporate that at the end of the scene, will you? Uh, I drew myself up to my full then six foot nearly one. And I started to say, Mr. Spielberg, I am a classical actor. I need weeks and weeks to prepare. And I said, all right. And, 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 and we did it. Great fun. <laughs> Question right down front, Andrew. Young man down here. No, oh, down there, right here. We'll get him next. Do you next, Andrew? Go ahead. All right. Hello, John. It's so wonderful to have you with us today. Lovely to meet you too. And I just want to thank you for five of the roles that really inspired me that you did a wonderful job in. Sala from Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Last Crusade, and The Dial of Destiny. Um, Kasim, Aladdin's father from Aladdin and the King of Thieves. Um, Gimli from the Lord of the Rings movies. The Brian King from the two Aquaman movies. And last but not least, Wooly the Mammoth from Cats Don't Dance. <laughs> well, yes. Um, what you've done is basically reveal the fact that I'm a very lucky man. Uh, and I'd like to emphasize this. Um, an actor's life it has more chance and more luck in it than any other career that I know. I mean, if you're competent and you join a company as a, an 18-year-old and you learn the thing, it's possible to sort of work your way up and you can end up managing director. Actors are different. Actors need something that shows them off to the bigger public. And if an actor doesn't get that break, uh, you never necessarily know him. I, I went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art after I did my degree, and I taught for a year after as well. I, I was lucky enough to leave. We did, we did a show on Sunday night, and we started work on Mon I started work in the theater on Monday morning. Um, I worked. Um, and not everybody can. Everyone in my class, they all succeeded in one way or another. Of course, we had our tragedies. There was Lynette, who at the age of 42 had, had felt herself a failure and walked into the sea and drowned herself. Um, but everybody else, except one marvelous man, uh, they all had their big, they had their television series in England. 
Now, this guy, believe me, he was as talented as any of us, but he never had the great option. He never had the great chance. And I mean, if you look at, if you look at the stuff that I've been privileged to do, I mean, I mean, let's face it, I mean, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, uh, these are great classics of their sort. If you look at Lord of the Rings, it's, I think it's probably the greatest trilogy ever made, really. Uh, uh, and, 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 and wonderful series that, that appeal to children, uh, gargoyles, for instance. Uh, and by the way, Macbeth in Gargoyles, that history of Macbeth is more accurate in terms of the real historical Macbeth in Scotland than ever Shakespeare got when he wrote Macbeth. It really is brilliant. Uh, acting is... Acting is a collective thing, you know. The actor serves the director. The actor serves the money people who are paying and hope that this show may make them money. He also serves the script. He also serves his fellow actors. And he's got to do all those things and at the same time serve himself. And that's a tricky balance. Often young actors come in and all they're going to do is serve themselves. You're going to see the greatest damned young actor in the world and I'm going to show you that this film, in which I'm a tiny part, is really about me. And you see all the other actors going... Mm -hmm. um, it's... Actors have to have an ego. But that ego has to be tempered in some ways. And some actors can't do that. And some actors really don't have the ego. I think that the great stars have a huge ego. I mean, Connery, Connery was one of the two most successful actors that Britain had in movies in that time, in, in, in his generation. Uh, I've never met a more superior alpha male than Connery. He really, he really was the alpha male. Um, but he was lucky too. You know, he was a, he was, he was a milkman, wasn't he, in Glasgow and uh, he, he wanted to do a bit of acting. He managed to get one or two good television parts. Do you know, Shogun was actually written for him. James Clavell wanted him to play uh, Will Adams. And, uh, and Sean said, no, I'm a film actor. I don't do television. Um, then he got the Bond films. Um, and, and he became world, worldwide sort of ultra big star because of it and walked away from it. Uh, and you didn't really do that in those days. There are very few people who can walk away from a successful uh, franchise um, you know, and, and still have a life afterwards. Uh, an extraordinary, extraordinary quality that he had. Real stardom. And by God, ladies, he was a sexy fellow, let me tell you. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. You'd, you'd, see, you'd see those thin, rather blue lips just purse slightly in a smile. Uh, and those, those eyes would just crinkle up a little bit. And women from the age of about 8 to 94 went, Oh. Um, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, have I avoided the question successfully? No. Andrew, what's your, you have a question, Andrew? Go ahead. All right. Anyway, you've had your question. Uh, uh, it's all right. You've had your question. Go on, you off. find somebody else. Sorry. I'm sorry. Gentleman down here. I tried. 
Hi, I'm Mr. Uh, I beg your pardon, lady down no, here. Okay. I've got my glasses. I forgive me. That's okay. Um, I am such a big fan, especially of you know, um, anything in television. And you did a guest um, appearance in one of my favorite um, series was, um, you know, Robin or Sherwood. You played, you played um, uh, Richard King. Lionheart. Mm -hmm. Yes. How is it? Uh, what did you do to get prepared for that? Well, I'm. I, I love history, and I, I know a, a, a bit about history. And um, the Plantagenets are monsters. They are the most violent. They're, they're, they're generations. They're, they're 80 years from being Vikings. They come from Normandy, where the Northmen went. Um, they conquered Paris virtually. Well, they didn't quite conquer Paris, but they became, they settled in France, they became great dukes, and then they came to England, and we have the Norman conquest. And the Plantagenets are all, they are all violent, ruthless, completely self-involved men. They're great leaders and great warriors, but they are monsters. And, and to be able to convince that uh, and play, and play um, Lionheart, uh, you, want, you, want, you want to sense the sense that, that, that this is a charismatic leader and a great soldier. The fact that he can overcome little John alone indicates, you know, that he's got a physical proudness, but you want also to get that sense that, you know, England is to be used to further the military ambitions of, of, of the Plantagenets. Uh, and there's a ruthlessness there that, um, well, you saw that in, in a far greater way, actually, in The Lion in Winter, uh, with, with my old chum Peter O'Toole playing that magnificent part. Um, you know, and, and his wife leading the, his sons to war against him, and him being prepared, perhaps even, to execute his sons. You know, the... There is a savage world of power that we and you and I have never personally experienced, but is still there. And do not, do not mistake the activities of certain rulers in Eastern Europe and the Far East for being benign, civilized people like you and me. The great problem of, of, of Western, the Western tradition is that we do not understand that there are people who really would prefer to see you dead than compromise. And uh, that's a hard lesson to learn. Um, anyway, that's sort of irrelevant, isn't it, really? But you enjoyed um, Lionheart, did you? I, I liked Robin of Sherwood as well. A good show. Um, well, why did he leave at the end of the first season to go and do something so... Pardon me. <laughs> I did that in the theater once. I have never... It, 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 was, a, it was a melodrama. And um, it was in Coventry. It was my first job. And we were doing this, and, and they were rebuilding Coventry after it had been bombed in the wartime. They were rebuilding it, and they were building new drains, and they were using explosives to, you know, to shatter rock. Um, and so, you know, at the beginning of the week, we'd hear bump like that in the distance. Anyway, one night, it was as if it was right under the theater. It was a boom, and the entire audience was absolutely like that, and, and I couldn't resist it. I said, whoops, pardon me. <laughs> the audience collapsed in laughter, but we never got them back into the play. 
<laughs> and of course, the stage manager is the authority. And she gave me a dressing down that I am still shaking from. How dare you? You ruined an entire performance, you egotistical, selfish, self-serving little shit. <laughs> and she was quite right. But it was a good gag, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get a few more. We have another question over here. Thank you. Two, two. Hi. Hello. I was just wondering, um, how would I want to word this? Uh, was your brother-in-law mad at you when you told him that his car got blown up by a Nazi tank and did he take the camels as uh, payment? Well, if you want to get into the intimate family details, the, the delicate negotiations that have to go on when you borrow your brother-in-law's car and it gets blown up and your friend Indiana Jones may his soul and ever, ever last and increase, but uh, you know, th those camels, those camels could have indeed been great compensation for my brother-in-law, but it was not to be. However, uh, <laughs> I did manage to get a little bit of loot from the Germans <laughs> that I didn't tell Indy about. Um, but then, never mind anyway. But yes, the, the brother-in-law and I got on very well until the Germans shot him. But um, my sister married again, yes, several times. The Germans shot them too. Yes, but they missed me. And in the end, isn't that what life is about? Avoiding the bullets. <laughs> <laughs> We got time for about three more questions. Is that good? John, is that okay? We have time. Oh, yes, 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 indeed. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Hi. Hi. Way there. Um, one, I just wanted to say that my whole family were super big fans of Lord of the Rings. And just wanted to say thank you for being Gimli because you're just such a good character in there. But my question is about um, Princess Diaries 2. It's, ah. one, it's one of my favorite movies, and I just want to know how was your experience so being on set? Slowly, let, it, let the pain be felt first. <laughs> yes. Your question about the Princess Diaries 2. Yes, say it. I suppose you think that that little bitch should become queen. <laughs> An ordinary common person and, what is worse, an American. <laughs> Taking over an ancient kingdom. Robbing a family steeped in dignity and aristocracy. People who know how to handle other people, especially lesser people, and to tax them properly. Um, you think that that wretched girl was right to steal an ancient crown from my nephew. My God, you've got a nerve even standing there and just raising the question. I have to tell you that um, The Princess Diaries is... Um, is the only film that my 18-year-old daughter has seen that I have been in. She, uh, I'm, uh, she's not here. I am allowed to abuse her anyway in public. Um, yes, and, but last year I took her to a fan convention in Brazil and I introduced her to Chris Pine. 16 years old. And... Uh, so I, at the end, I said, look, first time you've been abroad uh, to Latin America. Um, what, are your, what are your memories? And she said, well, first of all, Daddy, I was surprised how many people like you. <laughs> Thanks, kid. <laughs> uh, and I said, anything else? And she said, yes. How tall Chris Pine is how handsome Chris Pine is. 
You know, how very well dressed Chris Pine is. When Chris Pine hugged me, you know, you could feel how strong Chris Pine is. I, I think I dropped off to sleep there. But when I woke up again a few minutes later, I think we were on 11 or 12, and it was still about the virtues of Chris Pine. And, um, and, uh, and then this 16-year-old daughter had that expression on her face that you guys know about. You know that moment of terror when you see the Bacchic, the Bacchic savagery of women appear for a, just for a glimpse. This 16-year-old girl ends up saying, is he married? <laughs> Added to which, of course, Chris Pine is one of the loveliest men you could meet. He is a wonderful actor. He is charming, charismatic, gentle, kind, modest. He's bloody perfect. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he does. He does get the good looks from my side of the family. I think you can see a resemblance there, can't you? Yeah. Let's, let's get one last question. What a wonderful panel. Let's get two, two last questions. Hi, I really enjoyed you in the TV show Sliders. Was, <laughs> was there a particular world that you visited that you personally would have liked to stay on? I'm sorry, I did, I'm old and deaf, and the hearing aids don't seem to be working with this damn fan bunny. To say the question again... Was there a particular world that your character visited that you personally would have liked to stay on? In Sliders. In Sliders. No. No, <laughs> no there wasn't. This is the world I choose to be in. I am probably as well read in history as most of the people in this room. This is the golden age. We are, my generation in particular, lived in the golden age. The best age of all time. The best age for women of all time. Don't forget, in, since 1900 to about now, the life expectancy of women has virtually doubled. Um, before now, well, let's look. For about 100,000 years, we had an ice age. Um, that ice age ended and, and then continued into what we call the Stone Age. The life expectancy of women, probably for the last 100,000 odd years, uh, well, you'll find male skeletons in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even their 60s sometimes. You'll never find a female skeleton over the age of 30. Life expectancy of a woman, up until relatively recently, was 21 years. Right? Now, on average, women outlive men. Uh, this is an age where we've never really, we've never really starved. We've never really feared, um, you know, that the, that the police vans would burst in on the door, you know, and arrest us and take us off and shoot us. Uh, we've never been truly, truly destroyed by an employer who says, You'll never work again. You will never work in this town again. And had the power to actually make sure that we never did work again. This is the most glorious golden age of mankind that there's ever been. And, and we should try and preserve it and make sure that we pass it on. Just one more question. One more question. We can't thank you enough for doing this. Thank you. Hi, John. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your role of Rodriguez in Shogun, because I absolutely love that. I've seen the new one that's out on Hulu, and I like that too, but I like 
your characters better in the original series. So I'm curious to know, um, have you seen the new one on Hulu? And how did you like playing Rodriguez? And what did you find interesting about that role? Well, the problem for Richard Chamberlain, who is, who is cast as it, um, Clavel writes a passive hero, a man who is constantly reacting to events and circumstances that he doesn't understand. The problem with that for the actor is you cannot, you cannot control the pace of the scene and therefore the arc of the story. The book is brilliantly written. Our script, I haven't looked at the new one yet, but our script was a brilliant recension of the book. I mean, I, I, I like words and I'm pretty picky with, with, with writers. Eric Berkovici, who did the screenplay, he and I argued for five months over five words. Uh, he let me get away with two. He, he was probably right with his two, and he stole another one. But, um, but the problem for, the, for, for Chamberlain is, how do I keep the pace in this sort of thing? We've got Japanese talking in Japanese, because we wanted to have that, that sense of the, the incomprehensibility of being in that society. But, you know, it very easily those questions, that Japanese tone, can sort of daze an audience. It's very easy to fall in. So I looked at it, I looked at it just technically and thought, the best way I can serve the script and the best way I can serve Richard is to come in to every scene with all the energy that I can, even if I'm over the top, you know, and just drive, put power into it so that he has time just to undercut and relax and play. And Richard was such a sharp actor. When I started with the, in, in the first scene, he went, He knew. He knew that if, if I came into a scene, he didn't have to push the scene. He didn't have to drive it through. He could just stand back, underplay, and, and of course, just, he steals the scene. But I had to act as a um, motor, I think, to drive the thing forward. Richard, by the way, I, taught me more about being a real professional. He showed me what a real leading man does. We had been, we were meant to be in Tokyo doing the, the, the storm sequences, the shipwreck, for three weeks. We were there for eight weeks. We had lost a month out of our schedule. We went down and morale was really low. We went down to Nagashima to shoot the real live boating things. No one had built a galley in Japan for 300 years. The galley they had built was really top heavy. And the water, the, you have to understand, it's 100 degrees. It's 100% humidity. We would change our shirts five times a day and we still stank of sweat uh, afterwards. The boat was rocking. The sea was like glass. The, the light from the sun came bouncing up onto the waves and into our eyes. And the boat... <laughs> the director was lying on the ground, he'd taken three drama memes and he was directing like this. <laughs> okay, let's go again. Action. <laughs> and cut. 
The, the lighting cameraman, Chewy Elizondo, tough little Mexican-American, really, you know, really tough. He would film, and the director would say, cut, and Chewy would go to the end of the boat and throw up over the side <laughs> and come back again. You know, the sun beat down us that, that first day and the boat was rocking. And constantly there would be crew members going, what? <laughs> Richard sat down on his little chair, put a little umbrella up, took his fan and would start fanning himself like that. And when somebody in his eye line started throwing up over there, just changed his eye line. <laughs> <laughs> By two o'clock in the afternoon, we were all looking at him, begging him with our eyes to say, oh, come on, guys, this is above and beyond the call of duty. And, we were, and I think that if he'd said that, I think that, that possibly, the, possibly the show could have fallen apart because we were so desperately low and down. But he didn't. And... Uh, you know, he just appeared to be completely unaffected by the fact that half the crew and most of the cast were, you know, just dropping around him. And we got through the day. And the next day we went back and it wasn't quite as bad. And the next day we went back and it got better. That's what a real leading man does. It isn't just playing the part, it's holding the company, the crew, the actors, the director, holding them all together, saying, yes, now we do this, okay, uh, let's do it, come on, all right, let's try it now. He holds the company together. He is not the problem, he is the solution. And that is one of the greatest lessons I ever learned from an actor. I love that man, I adore him, I respect him beyond belief. What a great man. And of course, we're still behind in the schedules. So, I think it was MGM, I, can't, I think it was MGM, sent out an executive white vice president to cut one hour out of the show. I can't really tell you this story because there are children present. Um, but anyway, he did turn up and... Uh, well, I can tell you a bit of it. So he turns up, uh, and he's a 26-year-old executive vice president with authority to cut one hour, hour, hour out of a show. Now, this was a script that was so well written, you couldn't take a word out of a line. You couldn't take a line out of the scene. And you certainly couldn't take a scene out of the whole play without missing some important information. Our producer was this man called Eric Berkovici. Now, Berkovici was an interesting man. He was the man who had once gone into a conference in the writer's building at MGM, and when everyone was assembled, he opened his briefcase and took out an Uzi and a hand grenade and said, today the writer's view will prevail. He did get bad from the writer's building, and I don't think you could do it these days, but you weren't really meant to do it in those days either. Um, but, um, so I said to him, Eric, uh, he called us all together and said, look, we've got this lad coming. Um, he's got authority to take an hour out of the show. I want you all there. I said, Eric, um, are we going to see one of these great legendary explosions of yours? And he looked at me pityingly and he said, young man, watch and learn. The guy comes in, he's a nice lad, but you know, he, you know he's, he knows what his job is. And it's, you know, he's 26 and Eric was in his 60s and it was, Eric, Eric, baby, you know what? I'm on your side. Trust me, trust me, Eric. Uh, I look, I've got to take you, I've got to cut a, an hour out of your show, Eric, but believe me, 
you know, I'm on your side. And uh, Eric said, no, I understand. Here's the script. He said, take the script, edit it. I will, I will. But trust me, I'm on your side. And, uh, and, um, and Eric said, um, look, all I want you to do is whenever you make a cut, uh, just write a note of how we connect. There's anything, baby, anything. Uh, how we connect what's gone before with what comes after. Uh, of course I will, of course I will. He leaves the room and Eric says, oh, one moment, one moment, your passport. The local hotel has got to take your passport because all our passports have to go to the local police because that's the way they do things in Japan. Yep, sure, Eric, okay. Okay, guys, catch you later. Um, and he goes and Eric looks at him and looks at us all and he says, right. Your job is to take him out every night and get him very drunk and um, whatever. Um, and, uh, and that's what we did, actually. We took him out and he had a wonderful time. And, um, and after a week, he hadn't actually managed to make much of it. And after two weeks, the studio started calling up, okay, when are you coming back with the, with the cuts? Uh, and uh, of course, he, you couldn't do it. You couldn't take a word out or a scene out without endless complications. And you couldn't certainly do it when you were as drunk as we got him. <laughs> By week three, he was saying, look, I've got to go back. And Eric was saying, I'm terribly sorry, we haven't got your passport back yet. <laughs> Knowing full well it was in his safe. <laughs> and by week five, when finally we caught up with everything, we had our show back again. Uh, and he went back, um, having said, well, I got him, you know, I didn't manage to cut the script, but we're back on schedule now. And I think he probably got a promotion for that. But, but that's show business. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. What a joy. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand this. Well, that's how we end the day with a fabulous Q&A. You can do better than that. You are all... Thank you. You're, you're a wonderful audience. And thank you for having me. And um, enjoy this wonderful weekend because we certainly can't be doing anything outside that's more fun than this. You're wonderful, and I thank you for being such a wonderful audience. John Rustavis, thank you so much. This is John Glover, and you are watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Lionel Luther recommends it. Ah, have some fun. Follow your fandom.